e-commerce. Um, just a quick word about myself. Um, so I am a data scientist and the data science ambassador here at SMEC, Smarter E-Commerce. Uh, my background is in computational linguistics, and I'm especially interested in uh, neural networks and machine learning and combining that with traditional linguistics. And our company, Smarter E-Commerce, we provide um, solutions for retailers who are selling things on Google, so who have um, pay-per-click campaigns. We have lots of different software for them. And uh, basically, our connection to Perform EU is through one of our wonderful SMECIs, Oliver Greifenstein. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to Andreas for having me and everyone for joining me. And let's get into it. So, you can just a quick sound check, another thumbs up. Everyone can hear me okay? You sounding good? Sounding good, looking good. Okay, fantastic. Oh, looking good too. Well, that's nice. Yeah, looking good and rocking very well. <laughs> okay, so here's the plan for today. Uh, I'll talk about um, e-commerce, AI, and a, uh, a crazy um, buzz in AI, which is natural language processing, why that's becoming so important. Um, I'll demonstrate how it works by using the case study of a virtual assistant, so your phone when you're speaking to it, how it knows what you want to say, and that therefore, of course, buy. Then I'll look at some other applications of natural language processing in e-commerce with some real-world examples from uh, real companies, including a local Linz-based one. And I'll also talk about the uh, natural language processing work uh, and products that we have at SMEC, and they'll, then there'll be some time for um, a conclusion and questions. It's a lot to get through. It is a bit lecture-based because I know that the original audience is students, so all the SMECIs, uh, sit tight, um, enjoy the ride. Don't worry if I don't read everything on the slides or if there is a lot of information on there, that's because I want to make the slides available afterwards as a resource um, and uh, just go through the main points now. So let's talk about the rise of natural language processing in e-commerce. So here I want you to use your chat. Um, so just send me a couple of messages. Think of the last time you tried to communicate with a machine. And I don't mean your dishwasher, I mean, you know, a machine that has some way of responding to you. What machine was it? Like a search engine or your phone or something? And how did it go? Just really quickly send me a message. Oh, it's our right one. Okay, somebody tried to talk with their uh, with their robot. Nice. Um, I didn't know they could speak, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so um, Alexa worked forty percent well. That's pretty bad considering that it's Alexa. They have enough money to invest in that. Um, okay, finding music. Alexa, Alexa. Uh, okay, Alexa can close the blinds. That's good. Okay, so we have some satisfactory results and maybe some not good ones. Um, and even if you have recently had a bad experience talking to a machine, I'm sure you've had that in the past. So what is the problem? Natural languages are hard. That's because they are infinitely creative. So you can say the same thing in many, many different ways. And that's why Google gets, for example, 500 million unique queries every day. Natural languages are structured as well. So for a query like brown gloves, um, the grammatical roles mean that orange gloves is more relevant than a brown purse. And as humans, we know this instinctively, but that's not so easy for something like a machine to understand. Uh, another characteristic of natural languages is that they are inferential. So there is also meaning that is not said. So again, we know that if I search for a formal dress, I don't want casual dresses, but formal gowns might be okay. And what is the distinction? How should a machine know that? Languages can also be lexically and syntactically ambiguous. Okay, so that means the words and the structure can have multiple meanings, and sometimes it's not immediately clear which one is correct. And that could be, for example, a problem for large retailers when they have many, many products. When one word can mean many things, that means one search term could mean many very different results not necessarily all relevant. Natural languages are also context-based. So a word like affordable doesn't mean the same thing to, all this, the, to different people. Uh, negation is a small but real problem as well with natural languages. So let's say you, you search for sleeveless shirt and a classic keyword search um, does some cleaning of that to take off the suffix less 
all it's got then is sleeve, sleeve shirt, and it's going to show you results for sleeve shirt, which is 100% not what you wanted. So that's a real problem too. And last of all, languages can be multimedia based as well, as you just saw. So the problem continues because natural languages are what you and I and consumers use and what we want to use. Um, we describe products in infinite different ways, but retailers can't do that. They have fewer and fixed descriptions, so we immediately have a discrepancy that's going to harm a basic keyword search, for example, um, and obviously producing a bad customer experience is bad for business. Another issue um, is missed opportunities. So let's say you want to search for top semi-professional cameras 2019, which I did last year. I didn't do it in an e-commerce website, not Saturn. I tried that again, by the way, in Saturn um, in preparation for this talk, and it had no results, which is very bad. So users who want to do that kind of search, to do that kind of research, they'll go to Google and not to your website, which is a lost opportunity. Another issue is that with the rise of speech-enabled technologies, so uh, your home device, your mobile phone, your talking car, all of that, users don't want to have to adapt themselves to machines anymore. And lastly, here's an opportunity. Listening to customers is really valuable. So we can get insights from what they say on, say, Twitter and in reviews and things like this, but it's huge, it's unstructured, that is the data, the language data, and to understand it is resource intensive. And of course, the language is tricky, like I said, and that's why we need some kind of sophisticated artificial intelligence to manage it. So what do we do? We turn to natural language processing, which is all the rage right now. So natural language processing consists of two main areas, natural language understanding, so obviously taking in the input from humans, and then natural language generation, so trying to respond in a way that doesn't sound like a total robot. And to do this, natural language processing combines artificial intelligence, machine learning, and linguistics to make computers be able to understand and use human language. So let's talk this through with a demonstration. So we're going to test ourselves first of all. So again, guys, get, get your fingers ready. I want you to use the chat. I'm going to uh, present you with an unfinished sentence on the next slide, and I want you to just read it and then type down the first word that comes into your head. Okay, ready, steady, go. So the sentence is, hey Siri, book me a blank. Oh, nice, nice, okay. Flight, flight, holiday, room, hotel room, room. Uh, okay, all right, everybody wants to clearly go on holiday. We can't even do that right now, guys. Um, but yeah, okay, perfect. Now let's see what Google came up with for the same half sentence. Okay, book me a flight, book me app. That's probably short for appointment. Book me a ticket, book me a taxi, book me a hotel. Okay, so fantastic. Um, you're as smart as Google, congratulations. Um, so how did this work? Well, the thing is that we all have a language model in our heads, so we understand how language works, and we've learned that through our whole experience speaking languages. And search engines uh, have language models as well, and many uh, natural language technologies do, um, and they have learned that language model through machine learning. So just quickly, what is a virtual assistant? It might sound obvious, but let's just double check our understanding. So it's a software application. It waits for a wake word, like hey Siri, or OK Google, it performs natural language understanding on what you say to it, and then it attempts to complete a task for you using the information that it's understood. So natural language understanding, that's a really crucial part. How does that work? So of course, first of all, you have automatic speech recognition, which is also known as speech to text. Uh, and by the way, when we are dealing with spoken text, we can call it spoken language understanding. Then we have to work out what the customer wants. So what area are we in? What domain are we in? Are we in, for example, flights and holidays? Or are we uh, in personal services like um, getting a haircut or something like this? Then we also need to know what's the user's intent. So what do they actually want to do? If we're in the flight domain, do they want to book a flight or maybe just get information about flights? Once we know those two things, domain and intent, we know what kind of tasks they might want to do. And we know what sort of information 
the, um, the API is going to need to complete those tasks. And it's going to be the job of your virtual assistant to get that important information out of what you say so it can pass it on to the API. And so it does that by loading a set of expected slots. Okay, so for flights, an expected slot would be something like arrival city and departure city. Um, so it's loaded up those slots and then it has to try and assign those slots to the rest of the words in what you say. And of course, if it doesn't understand, it'll try its best or it might ask you some further questions. But essentially what it's doing is building a semantic frame, so a more structured representation of the information what you have said. And then it tries to use that resulting structured information to achieve a goal. So let's take an example. So you start speaking to your phone and you say, hey Siri, book me up. And it's already going, oh God, oh God, oh God, where am I, what domain am I in? Am I in flights, am I in personal services? I don't know. And then you say flight and it says, bingo, I'm in the flight domain. And I already know you said book. So I also already know that your intent is to make a, a, a booking. So um, these aren't necessarily steps that are always completed one after the other. They can um, uh, reinforce each other. So now we have the domain and the intent, and we know our slots are going to be things like, as I said, departure city. And then you finish your sentence from San Francisco to Leeds. Your virtual assistant will assign all the slots to the words in your sentence and pass that onto the API, such as the kayak flight search, um, and try to complete the task for you. Then, of course, um, the API will return some results and natural language generation is used to convert this back into human understandable text. And natural language generation can also be um, taught through some kind of machine learning or it can even be a bit more simple template based or a combination. And maybe this is even converted to speech if it's say your phone and it's speaking to you. So, sounds simple, maybe, but the question is how does it actually get done? How do we do all of that? So natural language understanding has had an interesting history. Now, in the early days, we tried handcrafted rules, pattern matching, and we failed. It's simply too hard. So then we turned to statistical machine learning. So like all machine learning, um, this just means making predictions based on patterns of features in some kind of data, so language data, um, trying to learn language this way. We had some questions. So which features should we use? How do we extract them? Which models are best for learning? And we still have some problems. So statistical machine learning is still expensive. And uh, so expensive in terms of resources, not necessarily money, but people preparing data and things like this. And if we use other uh, pipeline components for getting the features that we want to give to our machine learning models, so, for example, a part of speech tagger will also look at the words in an utterance and say, this is a verb, this is a noun, and so on. Those components aren't perfect either, because they're usually also built with machine learning. So they can introduce their own errors and put a maximum threshold on the accuracy we're able to achieve. So, then we have breakthrough. Uh, everybody's favorite neural networks. We've all heard of them. Maybe some of us have uh, thought, I have no idea what that is and I don't even want to go there. Um, hopefully this clarifies things a little bit. So neural networks are still a kind of machine learning, um, but they learn to extract and combine information uh, into useful features for themselves. So this image here is a classic example of a convolutional neural network, which is used for image recognition. So uh, give me a thumbs up. Can you see my mouse when I move it around? I assume so, right? Yeah, okay, I've got people nodding. Awesome. That also means people aren't asleep, which is good. So uh, in this little diagram here in the middle, we've got uh, nodes in the neural network, okay? And they're all connected, which is why it is a net. And these individual nodes, as the input, so the image comes in, it passes through the network and the different nodes learn to be really good at identifying different useful features for solving the image recognition task. So this little node here, for example, might become really, really great at recognizing motorbike tires, but nothing else is useless at anything else. And this one might become great at recognizing handlebars, but nothing else. So separately, it's not necessarily going to do a good job of being able to find motorcycles in future pictures that include motorcycles. But when these all work together as a network, they are able to combine these features they've learned into a motorbike and recognize that that's what they're looking at.
So that's the breadth of neural networks. They're very successful, but they do require a lot of data and it is difficult to adapt them to different domains. So they're not perfect. Now in natural language processing, one of the reasons it's getting such a boom right now is um, a couple of revolutions. Firstly, word embeddings. So what word embeddings do is they learn to distribute words and so to arrange words in a semantic space. So think of a big, big multidimensional space all around you. If you try to arrange every word that you ever use around you based on how you use it um, and the context and common neighbor words, you might put all the cats and dogs here and then maybe uh, cows and horses close to each other but a little bit further away from cats and dogs and then lions and tigers a bit further away still because you're clustering them based on how these words are used. Um, and this is called word embeddings. And you do that also with machine learning. First, we've tried statistical methods and now we're using neural network ones. And what we found is that if instead of feeding words into your model, you feed these word embeddings instead, you're bringing all that information that's already been learned into the task and that has a huge impact. And that has enabled the latest breakthroughs um, in uh, pre-trained language models and transfer learning. Okay, so just very simply, what we do now is we make huge models pre-trained on millions and millions of words of text or billions. Um, and these models learn how to best represent the words for the task they're going to be doing. So something like natural language understanding, they'll learn how to represent the numerical uh, embeddings of these words in the best way possible. And uh, you can check this slide back later if you're curious to know why, but yes, they all, they are all named after Sesame Street characters. Um, and one of the latest models of Transformer is a huge deep neural network um, that's used to build these word embeddings and it uses an attention mechanism to, just like humans, learn to pay attention to uh, which words are more important when it's doing its encoding. And you'll see when I discuss, for example, Amazon later, they're also using attention. It's a, it's a very recent technique. So, huh, big, big deep breath. That was a lot of complicated information, but most of you are still with me, which is good. Let's put it into practice. Let's talk about some actual applications of natural language processing in e-commerce. Now, we're going to play a little bit of bingo here as well. I hope everybody knows the game bingo. Again, get your chat ready. I'm going to list some general uses for natural language processing and language models and some e-commerce use cases. And the first person who, so, so when you have uh, interacted with five of these technologies in the last, say, week, then write bingo in the chat for me. And the first person to do it, I don't know, gets a virtual high five. Okay, so next word or emoji prediction and swipe text or in the e-commerce word, search bar hints. Spell check and autocorrect. I said the first five, Marcus Harant. <laughs> you need five in a row. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad you're paying somewhat attention. So spell check and autocorrect, recovering from query errors. Oh man, you guys are cheating. Uh, spam filtering and automatic email categorization could be used in e-commerce for directing customer service queries. Speech to text, text to speech, shopping assistance, optical character recognition, so reading um, words from pictures, camera enabled shopping apps, image captioning, generating product titles, generating reports and news, even fake news, um, generating app, ad copy and product descriptions, machine translation, obviously search and display in multiple languages, and text summarization. Could be used in e-commerce for social media listening or sentiment analysis, um, so data-driven digital marketing. Okay, so bingo, 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 fantastic. Um, not sure everyone quite got the rules there, but you're all winners. You all get a virtual high five. Thanks for playing. So there, as you might have noticed, there are way too many things that we could talk about. I would love to, but um, I can't keep you all day, so I'm just going to deep dive into a few technologies. Uh, so knowledge graphs, they're not so new. I mean, of course, we're improving them right now, but the concept is not so new. Semantic search, it's pretty new. And chatbots and conversational automation, the future. So knowledge graphs, let's start with that. So knowledge graphs represent concepts and relations in what's called a semantic network. And these are structured in a way that machines can understand them. So think about Google. Basically, everything Google knows is also in a, an enormous knowledge graph. It had 
uh, 500 million entities and 3.5 billion facts about them when it was introduced in 2012. So you can imagine what that contains right now. And this is what Google said about their graph. So the model learns from search behavior that words relate to real world entities. So words equal things. It might sound simple and obvious, but that was kind of a revolution. Um, so Google says the next generation of search, which is, I guess, what we're in now, will utilize the collective intelligence of the web and understand the world a bit more like people do. That was the goal. And what can we use knowledge graphs for? For example, improving search, question answering, building recommender systems, um, and also recognizing similarities between products to um, treat them similarly when we don't have enough data about one or the other. Um, and a lot of NLP techniques are used within building knowledge graphs. So, for example, identifying and extracting entities. This is really similar to the slot filling that I've already described to you. Um, but instead of looking for something like a departure city, uh, you're looking for something more general, like, a, like people, organizations, times, um, numbers, and this sort of thing. So um, the process of training an entity extraction model is similar to what I explained for slot filling. You just have different data and different tags. Um, uh, knowledge graphs also require learning to distribute context in that semantic space that's, uh, that's all around us, as I mentioned. And they can do things like learning logical rules, which we could use to predict um, and, and shape customer journeys. So a simple logical rule is something like if a person A is born in the city B, and if the city B is in country C, then person A is of the nationality of country C. So let's think of an e-commerce example. We might say, or we might try and learn from a knowledge graph that also includes purchase uh, history. Um, okay, customer A purchased product B. Product B has price C. Um, and what we've learned is that when that is the case, um, customer A might be interested in some kind of upsell for free shipping, for example. So this is a real example um, taken from Amazon documentation, uh, unfortunately not so nice and clear though, um, of their knowledge graphs for um, a detergent. And you see here uh, in the middle, we've got two entities, so Thai plus Febreze, I guess, and Thai plus color maybe. Um, and they have some similarities in common. They're both liquids, they're both detergents, they're both from brand Tide. And we have other variations on them, descriptions, uh, different information like this. And if you can imagine, uh, Amazon will just be building up a network like this um, for lots and lots of different products. So how do they do it? Well, they take information from things like ontologies. So uh, and it's like, and an ontology is basically a way of structuring concepts as well. Um, an encyclopedia might be an ontology. There are purpose-built ones like WordNet. Um, and uh, they can also do that entity extraction that I mentioned. Um, from the web or from the retailer's own data. Now, building knowledge graphs obviously requires integrating uh, graphs together. And um, how do they do that? Well, surprisingly, until recently, they were still experimenting with more classic, and I don't say that in a way to put it down, but more classic, some would say simpler uh, machine learning techniques like random forests, which is something we also use at Smarter E-commerce, uh, with very simple features. They also tried other simple logistic regression and even complex neural networks, and they actually got similar results. So it's important to remember that sometimes the biggest, most expensive, complicated neural network is not the best option. Nowadays, they do use um, graph neural networks, though, which uh, learn to, to generate these products in this space. And what do they want to use this for? Well, representing relations between products on Amazon.com, of course, but also um, relations between, say, creators of content in Amazon Music and Prime Video that's going to help with things like recommendations. And they want to be able to represent information more generally for, say, question answering with Alexa. And here's an example. Again, this is from Amazon's own documentation uh, or a presentation from them uh, of one use of their graph. So they're looking here. OK, you, you can put in the chat because I know this is going to get a response. Put in the chat if you're a Star Wars fan. Um, uh, and so this is what they're doing. So they're looking at trends and, and, and products and what customers are doing to see, OK, which characters may be more important at the moment, which is more on trend, Yoda or Darth Vader. So they might look at all the different products featuring both. Um, and they can also start to ask questions like, OK, is there a trend suddenly of Darth Vader lamps? 
and um, why does someone who uh, buys this land also buy this chair? So moving on, because I've got to be quick. Um, that was that was knowledge graphs. Now a similar concept which which uses knowledge graphs is called semantic search. Okay, so the idea of this is to go beyond keywords to intent and meaning to get more results that still be relevant. Okay, so it's not about what the customer said, it's about what they meant. So take an example. Um, instead of doing a keyword search in a retailer site index, semantic search will look for meaning in the query and meaning in the corresponding ontology or knowledge graph. We'll find a best matching point and it can then return some additional related in, uh, entries. Um, and this is exactly how you might stumble upon um, you know, one brand that you really like that's similar to a brand that you know you already like, for example. So how does it work? Well, there's a few features. Natural language understanding helps to um, infer meaning that is unsaid and also to disambiguate similar concepts, so to, to distinguish between two similar things. Um, user and query context adds relevance and personalization. So user context is about you and query context is whereabouts on the website are you, uh, what did you just search before and so on. Um, product and descriptor, descriptor awareness helps identify things like in your query, which words are the most important describing the main item and which are just attributes and which of those are the most important attributes. So I don't know. Um, Women's size seven um, football shoes. Shoes is obviously the primary item, but women's size seven football are, are all important attributes. But if you put something like blue as well, it might learn that that's not a deal breaker. Um, and of course, the interlinking within this graph, graph is what helps broaden the results. So I'm going to take a, uh, another real world example now from a company called Blue Reach. Um, and how they do semantic search. So here's an example of identifying product types and attributes. Now, if you're savvy, you might notice that what we have here is, um, so here is a query and here is, for example, a, a not related uh, product description and every word has a tag. So this is again, quite similar to slot filling or entity recognition. Again, you can, you can train a model to be able to do this kind of labeling. Um, and by doing this labeling, you understand more about what the customer wants and what the merchant has to offer. Then uh, another example of adding contextual awareness is, let's say Nike is a top seller, but only among elite runners and not everybody. And if the query is just sneakers with no extra details and the context is general, there's no reason to think we're dealing with an elite runner, then we might actually rank a uh, not such a top seller higher because it's more generally better. We can also learn synonyms. So, uh, for example, you're on a website looking for leather espadrilles. That's a word that I learned when I first came to this country. Never heard of it before. You're not getting any results, but then you're using site navigation to still find shoes and buy them. And semantic search can learn um, through those patterns that espadrilles equals slippers equals shoes. Here's another example from another company, uh, Clevu. Um, so we have one of their customers um, and we have searched for floral drapes. Now, notice that neither of the search term appears in the results, okay, but they're still relevant. And as a bonus question, first one to write this in the chat, can you spot the assistance of the language model? Does anybody notice another little issue? I'll give you five, four, three. No, nobody's noticed it. Okay, um, the language model has performed autocorrect correction on drapes because if it had searched for drafts, it wouldn't have found anything. Um, right, moving on again to um, chatbots and conversational automation. Okay, so how would you feel about an experience like this? Okay, so I need you to, to, to look at, stop looking out the window now and look at the screen. You've got to read this with me. So you are the blue text communicating with a chatbot. This chatbot happens to be, um, I think, introducing people to a new game and how they should play it. Okay, what is the goal? Chatbot says, I don't know the word okay. You say, what's my goal in this game? Chatbot, I don't know the word what's. I don't know the word goal. You, getting very annoyed now, say, do you know anything? The chatbot says, I don't know the word do. Okay, so 
I think you can all agree that that's not a great customer experience. Um, that looks like it's a kind of simple rule-based chatbot there um, that can't do necessarily too much. It's definitely not satisfactory. So um, we want to... <laughs> Uh, Marcus Hoffer, your matrix screen is dis distracting people. <laughs> distracting me too. I thought it was a bug, but it is. Yeah, I tried to change it. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, all right. So um, we obviously want to do better with chatbots than um, than that example I just gave you, and we can with advances in natural language processing. Um, and they are a great case study because they combine so many techniques. Just for example, this screenshot here is using optical character recognition to read the characters in the receipt uh, or yeah, in the receipt um, it's recognized with truly intended domain detection okay this is a, a, a packet number um, the customer wants to do some kind of search for their packet so it queries the api um, it generates in natural language a, a response of information and then it understands the user response as well to that so why are chatbots useful um, they make merchants immediately present and give brands a voice they improve customer service for obvious reasons. Um, they let you automate um, different queries from simple and frequent ones, even to more complex ones. And if they get really stuck, they can hand over to a human. So you're combining humans and AI. Um, you can use chatbots to do things like getting user insights and providing upsells and recommendations. You're building, you're building a re uh, relationship with consumers. Um, you can streamline data entry and ret retrieval by putting it into natural language, and the next company I'll talk about does just that. And of course, voice activation is easy, so we prefer it. So, um, Ubertech. Some of you may have heard of this because this is a local Linux company uh, that's also with us in the tobacco fabric. And I, when I say with us, I don't mean with us because none of us are in the tobacco fabric. Um, so they build a specialized bot framework for building dialogue-based products, so conversational automation. So one example use case, common search methods involve, include text-based search, which just queries a large data and returns possible matches. Or you might use narrow down search, which uses menu trees to kind of find the results. And behind both of these is a search index returning ranked results. But the ranking is really simple. The understanding is shallow. With natural language understanding, we can do a more intuitive search like Show me all yellow loafers under 100 euro, and we can get dynamic answer formats like those Google style results. So the Google uh, service seems to continue right onto the merchant's website, which is great. So how does on-site search work here? So of course we get a query and we perform, perform intent detection. Now if the intent is search, then we, we need to process the query um, to, to get a better result when we actually then query the, the underlying search um, index. So we might normalize synonyms, so find the most generic version of a search term, reducing, I don't know, espadrilles to shoes. Um, we normalize brands. So I guess everybody knows Yoohoo, but a, um, unless you have a very big knowledge graph with a lot of real world knowledge, the machine might not. So you normalize that to, to blue. We remove stop words like the, are, uh, and so on, the articles. We perform entity extraction. An entity is not just objects, but it might be things like price and language. And then we pass this modified query onto the website search index, or we simply apply these recognized attributes as search filters. So we get a more relevant result. And optionally, we can um, weight the results using a knowledge graph. So here's an example. The system has built a, a, a knowledge graph of cocktail ingredient relations from um, unstructured text data, so recipes. And you've got a query gin and tonic. And the natural language understanding, because it's just so good and has so much contextual understanding, it's learned that um, there are other meanings of tonic, like healing tonic. And it's brought you those as well. But in this case, they're not relevant. So um, the knowledge graph can relate intents. And yes, you can have an intent as specific as gin and tonic if you have a, a cocktail online shop, for example. And it can relate those intents and entities together to find a more relevant answer space in that graph and, um, and weight the search results accordingly to boost only the gin and tonic related hints. Now, going back to uh, the on-site search, let's say the intent detection actually comes up with the intent question. Well, then we can match uh, against some sample questions which already have relevant content, 
the bot can ask additional questions if it needs to, uh, and of course it interfaces with the relevant APIs to get the information you need. And then we present the results um, in an appropriate format. And let's have a look at some examples. So here we have before and after. We've got a keyword-based search on the left and an NLU, natural language understanding enabled search on the right. Um, the person has searched for books under 10 euro and on the left, they have got no results, kind of clever. Um, and so they've got a completely irrelevant suggestion for dream houses under 200,000 euro, which they can buy for 61 euro. I'm not even sure if that's an ebook. So that was a fail. Um, but here on the right, we have identified entities like uh, the language and the price um, and are able to use those to apply the relevant filters and get a more accurate result. Let's see another example. We've got now an intent that's a question. Uh, on the left, you've searched for a customer service email and got no results. On the right, using this enhanced search, we actually have a Google style card giving you all the details you need. And another example, you search for the delivery date of a packet number and it's given you a map where your package is and a planned date of delivery. So now, I bet my bosses are waiting for me to get to this, natural language processing at SMEC, at Smart E-commerce. So we already have a few little uh, products and tricks up our sleeve. So one is our, our product at Engine. Um, this is a perfect example of where um, sometimes the uh, the most robust, effective uh, natural language processing techniques don't require some huge, overly complicated model. So we automatically create text ads using merchant logic. So the merchant wants to highlight their unique selling point, like they have the best uh, range or the lowest prices. Um, and we can use their merchant data and automatically create targeted ads for their Google Ads account. So you have an example here. We have customer merchant data on the left. We're extracting the relevant information to build a text ad based on this uh, merchant logic, this business rule, so whatever they want to prioritize. Uh, another thing that we can do is keyword sourcing to enhance the, the text ads um, and also just help our customers when they are bidding on search queries. So 15% um, of worldwide search queries are unique. Okay, that's a lot. So customers are searching for the same things in different ways. And um, that's a, an, an endless source of keywords for our merchants. And we help the merchants try to serve as many of those crews as possible by taking the most relevant ones, the best performing ones, um, and using those in the text ads. So we take the, the Google search query report, and these are real uh, searches from customers. Then we filter by performance metrics, like must have some conversions so some sales, must have a certain return on ad spend. Um, and then we have the best keywords which we can use in the text ads. Another um, initiative that we have here or um, one of our areas of industry expertise is query sculpting, which is all about taking control back from Google. So for the non smekies just to set the stage, this here is a Google shopping ad. I apologize if you already know this because you are in e-commerce after all. And this is a Google search ad. So uh, another quiz for you guys just to wake you up. So you sell Nike shoes, but not Adidas. So tell me in the chat, which of the following queries would you prefer to trigger your ad? A, buy Nike shoes online, or B, compare Nike with Adidas. Okay, do we have some responses here? A, 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 well, someone said B. Okay, nice. Um, but most of you agree that it is A. Yeah, there's a stronger purchase intent here. And for Google search ads, you could bid more for the keyword Nike and bid less or nothing for Adidas to get a better chance of being shown with query A. But in Google shopping ads, that's not the case. You can only bid on product groups, not keywords. That means you would pay the same price for both queries, which I think we can all agree is not ideal. So there is a solution called query sculpting. Um, where retailers can use multiple campaigns and campaign priorities and negative keywords to split up the query traffic and set more appropriate bid budgets. I won't go into a huge amount of detail on this because my colleagues have already done a fantastic job. I think they're quite well known for their uh, work on query sculpting and I'll provide links to that in the slide deck. Um, but just very briefly, uh, this is one way that you, you can do it to get a little bit more control back from Google. Um, but 
A common way of doing it only involves really simple splits um, with very basic natural language processing. So just something like brand versus no brand, which is not a lot of control. So we try to go beyond this with term scoring, where we can use different factors to try and better sort the <laughs> better sort the search queries, uh, depending on their performance, um, to create more effective negative keyword lists for directly in the traffic. And uh, things like color reference, uh, this is the, the topic of the query, brand reference, and so on. This um, really robust uh, natural language processing can be used to, to better do query sculpting. Um, and then we have ongoing research. So we're really trying to tap into the natural language gold mine. So um, some questions that we're working on, things like, how is query performance affected by the presence of linguistic features? Obviously brand and maybe the category of product, but also maybe alphanumeric strings and special characters like um, price indicators, different attributes and intent words like buy versus compare. We also want to know, are there, are there common syntactic patterns in search queries? And what does that imply about users, intents and future performance? Um, we want to know, Additionally, can we learn to speak users' language and maybe use that for things like product title optimization? And just generally, how can we use our discoveries to provide valuable detailed insights? So it's it's an ongoing question that's just going to be with more and more questions the further we dive in, which is great for me. So I'm just going to wrap up now with a little prediction into the future from the people who know best in the business. So this is what's coming. Search is going to eventually combine insights from text data with uh, user history, behavioral data for really accurate personalized results. We're going to work on, uh, or the industry is going to work on integrating contextual understanding uh, within verticals, so within the, the, the kind of products, um, one, 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 yeah, one, one consumer vertical, so that humans can converse more naturally in the language of that vertical. You might wonder why I'm just talking about verticals here, and that's because, sure, maybe eventually we will be able to, to do this and converse in the language of any vertical at any time, but that's just a next step. That's a huge task, getting closer towards um, artificial general intelligence, which is a topic for another day. Um, another prediction is that small businesses are going to be able to compete here. It's not just going to be dominated by the huge brands because so many natural language processing tools are now open source and available that uh, you will be able to um, take advantage of that. Um, and lastly, personal and in-store virtual assistants are going to be everywhere and search is going to become guidance-based. So users will literally be able to speak out loud, I'm looking for a laptop for business, it has to be lightweight, I don't want to spend more than $1,000, and they'll get maybe just one or two really, really accurate results. So that's the prediction for the future. Now, I'm going to leave the summary here on the on the screen so that you can see what we've talked about today. Um, that's enough from me. And now I'm just going to open this up for questions. So first of all, I want to say thank you so much for um, letting me talk at you for 45 minutes. Um, and you can unmute yourself and ask me a question, or you can also pop that in the chat. So thanks, guys. And let's see what you have to say. And if nobody has any questions, then we get an early mark. <laughs> question here. Okay, Douglas. Yeah, you want to unmute yourself? I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. You can hear me? Okay, Douglas. Anyone else here, Douglas? Me or? Yes, yes. You, you muted yourself again, I guess. Yes. Try again, Douglas. Okay. Okay. Well, while we're waiting for Douglas to work, it, work out um, his question or his mute button, um, maybe if you also have a question, just type so it in maybe, the chat. Maybe, yeah, you could type in to the chat. Yeah, so Douglas can type, and if anyone else has some questions, they can also type it in there just not to interrupt him if he does unmute himself. So anybody else? Yes, Catherine, I've got a question for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, by the way, for 
excellent quality here. This is really, really an uplift in, uh, in knowledge straight, straight away. Yes. Uh, I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. And I would just like to ask you, um, obviously, the terminology around um, this world is extremely, um, it's in the press, it's in the news, it's obviously seen from different angles, you know, the, the various value statements people put on it, whether it's good, bad, whatever. But in, in the business mm -hmm. world that we live in, sometimes when we are uh, talking about the way that um, our products work, in, you know, to create value, to create uh, uplifts, we sometimes get lost in the language of machine learning versus AI versus algorithms. Could you mm -hmm. give a, a little bit of a steer on how to differentiate between those three terms and in what way we might use them most effectively? Sorry about the mm -hmm. long Does that make sense? No. No, it's okay. Um, that makes that makes perfect sense, and um, uh, I am planning on on covering this topic in the the data science open meeting, which just for the perform EU guys is is something we will be doing internally at Smart E Commerce. Um, so it is really common that they are uh, getting mixed up. Very simply, artificial intelligence is automating something that would normally require human intelligence. So artificial intelligence, yes, of course, is often now done with very complex machine le learning and neural networks, but it doesn't have to be. Even the earliest days of spam filters had simple rules like if this email mentions Viagra, it's spam. That's also artificial intelligence. You're just automating a task that would normally require someone to think. Yeah. So that's the first one. Machine learning is quite simply learning uh, insights from patterns that we find in data. And again, it started out more simply by, uh, say a classic example is predicting house prices using logistic regression. So you have lots of information about um, attributes of a house and about um, the prices. And a mathematical algorithm simply looks at all of those attributes, tries to make predictions for a, an, an unseen future house, so a, a made up house about the price, measures how wrong it gets and adjusts its predictions and so that we get a, a more accurate regression line. And so it's simply using statistics and learning from those many, many examples um, how to make some kind of prediction. Yeah. And um, uh, deep machine learning is just a new kind of machine learning where instead of using these statistical models, we use instead these neural networks, which are based on, they're still algorithms, they're still all maths at the end of the day, but they're inspired by the human brain and how it works. And those, those nodes and connections that I um, had a picture of, it's, it's inspired by the neurons in our brain and how they fire electrical activations at each other to pass and manipulate information. Um, so neural network is a new the kind of machine learning model and deep machine learning simply stacks many neural network layers on top of each other. And so that basically hopefully covers all these buzzwords you've been hearing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and neural networks. Okay. Is that okay? Well, that's really great. And then um, just that final piece, when we talk about an algorithm, we're not, mm -hmm. we're not necessarily um, referencing that with machine learning, are we? Or are we always referencing that to machine learning? Yes, so algorithm, I'm just meaning here like a mathematical function. So at the basis, all these models have mathematical functions to essentially look at the data, make a prediction for a, a test case, so a non-existent test case, measure how long they got and adjust themselves in yeah. whichever way is relevant for them, which is a little bit too complex to go into, yeah. uh, but they adjust themselves. Um, so the weights, for example, in the network and the connection strengths, um, and this is simply done by measuring that error and adjusting. So it's all math. So that's why I say algorithms. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Um, so, Rene, if oh, I pronounce yeah. that right, or oh, wait, I'm just going to answer Rene's question. What's the best anthropomorphic chatbot that you know? Um, I haven't had too many experiences with actually using chatbots. Um, I, and I tend to be more surprised at what they can't do than what they can um, perhaps that's because i'm i have really high expectations and high hopes when i interact with the chatbot i did think it was quite clever that uh, i noticed my google android personal assistant um, knows that i originally come from australia even though i bought the phone in europe it knows my original account i guess was australian and so it adds touches of australian personality into its interactions with me 
So little jokes and things like this, uh, little references to Australian life and Australian slang, I would not have expected that. And I found that very impressive. So I encourage you to talk to your iPhone if you want to, if you have an Android at least, and try to ask it some questions to see if it's also adapted a personality that fits your country. Um, now, someone someone started to talk to me and ask me that uh, question. Was that a Denise or Douglas or? Someone. someone it was me, Andreas, but I'll ask oh, okay. you question in the chat sure. too. Yeah. Okay, sure, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, just while he's writing that, I will just say to everyone who's oh, saying thank okay. you. Okay, uh, I just paid. Okay, so yeah. um, my question was, uh, do we have any projects or, or um, features, um, maybe products in mind, to how to combine data um, from different channels, uh, to combine different uh, channel data uh, to increase customer interaction, customer understanding using AI? Okay, so in, so when you say to increase customer interaction and understanding, do you mean um, to motivate customers to say, like, okay, I've put in a whole heap of effort to, to have some kind of conversation automation on my website, but my customers aren't using it. How do I teach them that it's available and motivate them? Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Uh, yes. Um, because, because this is one of our big challenges, uh, also in digital retail, to combine data from from different from the different channels. So we are not only talking mm -hmm. about online data, but only uh, but also data from the point of sale, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah, where we have a lot of where you have a lot of noise in your data, and mm -hmm. I guess uh, AI could play an important role to control that. And yeah, um, may, maybe you. I just ask you to, uh, if you know any projects or uh, also any approaches how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so, uh, uh, can't speak. So um, I don't necessarily know that I know of any big projects where we say, okay, this is our ambition, this is what we're trying to do. But I do know, for example, from my own work at Smarter e Commerce um, and also from my own studies, um, that what you need to do, what's really, really important is getting this language data into some kind of structured format. Because as I said, languages are very complex and very, very verbose. And the first thing you need to do is to bring some structure into it. Now, natural language understanding, as I, I went through with the example of virtual assistants, it can do that. But that's not necessarily the first step because that takes a lot of resources to set up. So even if you can do some things like you protect us, and it might be good to speak with them um, afterwards if they're if they're willing um, to, to go into this in more detail, but they're also combining lots of different data sources and they will also start with simple processing steps like removing all the messy stop words like the and at and ah and that's the same word, um, my and, and so on. Um, they'll try to normalize synonyms to a more generic and therefore more broadly understood format. They'll try to normalize brands and so on. So that you go from this huge, messy language string to something that's more concise and more labeled. And if you can do that for your multiple data sources, um, and of course that's going to require some, some human initiative to think, okay, what kind of pre-processing do I need for this data as opposed to this data? If you can do that and bring some structure to multiple data sources, then you can simply combine them. And then it's up to you as the as the inventor to, to decide what you want to do with that. So you can feed that to some kind of machine learning model if you have a relevant task for it to try and achieve, or you might simply use that in a program that you're developing. That next step is, is kind of up to you. Thank you. Okay, I hope that I hope, hope that's I I guess there is the question from from Douglas here on uh, the chat. So, have you considered oh, the adoption okay. of explainable AI tools for debugging your models or for mm -hmm. providing explanations for a customer during a chatbot conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Douglas. That's a fantastic question because yes, we definitely are. Um, we have been recently discussing that in the data science team. We recognise that this is really really important, and it's also very important for us at Smart E-Commerce. To, to be able to have that transparency and integrity because we do use some machine learning in our products and we want to be able to tell our customers 
why I'm always make a, a decision. And we also want to be able to offer more and more retail insights in the future, which we could gain from maybe understanding and interpreting our own models yet. So, of course, I uh, can't go into the details of what we are going to do, but we are definitely doing it. And it is a really, really interesting topic. So do keep reading on it. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, the idea of um, adding that in the chatbot conversation, that's pretty interesting. Um, I haven't seen any examples of it, but I think it's a good idea. Um, so this would be, it's a new challenge because of course it's one thing to be able to um, do some kind of model explainability, but often that just simply involves getting some kind of summary statistic out at the end or um, having some kind of visualization where you then as a human have to bring your knowledge to interpret that. So to then be able to further interpret that with the knowledge that humans normally have and then use natural language generation to put that into natural language and spit it back out at the chatbot so we can explain why you made a decision, that would be amazing. But I think that's a long way off, but it's definitely not a topic that's going to go away. Um, okay, and Anna asks, do you also take the customer situation into consideration, um, like gender, age, time of the day, and so on? Um, yes, we have, so we don't have, uh, at Smart Ecoms, we don't have information about customers because Google keeps that private, but Google definitely does. Just Google um, uh, their intent signals. Um, I'm not sure how much uh, proprietary information that they will give away, but there will be information online about what kind of intent signals they use, but those are perfect examples. So they do know about the customer, they know about what kind of affinity the customer has, so what kind of interest group the customer is in. Um, we can, we don't have that data, but we can consider things like um, the, the day of the week and the device when we are um, doing our automatic bidding strategies and things like that. Okay, uh, all right, we have two more minutes. Does anyone else have any other questions for me? Nope. Somebody's unmuted, but I think not. Okay, then I will simply wrap up and say um, thanks again to, to Andreas and Perform EU for inviting me. Thanks to uh, my company, Smart E-Commerce, for um, hosting this. I'm very sorry we couldn't actually host you in our office like we had planned, but you simply must come visit us one day because it's beautiful and we would be really happy to meet you all. Um, keep in touch. You can certainly keep in touch with me uh, if you like via my contact details here. I'll just leave them on the screen um, and I will make these slides available for you afterwards and a video will be available for download as well. Thousand thanks, Katrin. Thank you for your inspiring lecture. Thank you for taking time. And yeah, um, so uh, if possible, we would also share the recording uh, if you send us the link. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's okay. fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's and fine. As I, as I said, um, the only it only records me and my presentation. So, yeah. Uh, that's no problem. <clears throat> so yeah, and just one word to the PERFORM fellows, so we meet again uh, at 10.30 in our next uh, lecture, uh, so the link is posted on Microsoft Teams, see you there, and yeah, um, wish you a nice day, thanks, thanks for all. Thank you everyone, okay. really great, thanks so much. Thanks guys, see you Bye. later, have a great day. Thank you again. Okay, all right, on to the next meeting then. I'm going to stop this recording. Yep. And